Hi, and this is Bill Kennedy with the Arden Labs podcast. And today, our special guest is Brian Lyles. Hey, Brian. Hey, Bill. Hey, community. How are you all doing? Uh, hopefully, everybody's doing great. I know I am. I, I am so excited that you're talking with us today. You're somebody who, I guess I think I would, maybe we met about five years ago. And you're somebody who I've always thought was like maybe the most humble, caring human being, but I'm going to also say engineer, I think that I've met in this community. So I've always looked up to you and I'm really excited to, to get your story today. Oh, well, thank you. Um, it's um, on purpose and I th still think I have work to do, but I'm glad someone, um, like someone gets value out of this. So, okay. So what I'd like all the guests to do is kind of take two minutes to say where you are today, what you're doing, what you're focusing on. And then we're going to kind of talk about your story, about how you got here. Okay. Well, let's start out with today. It's January of 2021, and I am a principal engineer in the Telco and Edge BU at VMware. And what does that mean? Well, I am a VP level um, individual contributor, and I am the architect for our telco platform. And really what that means is with the advent of 5G, uh, we can now, um, all the things that we were running in hardware for your phone conversations can now be run in software. And telephone companies, these service providers are moving towards Kubernetes. So we're building product to allow uh, basically your telephone calls to go through Kubernetes and, and other things, but it's pretty exciting. That's what I do right now. So all of this equipment will end up running in those co-locations that like AT&T has all over the place. All that computer gets ripped out and this, you're running Kubernetes locally in those data centers? Yeah, actually we are. Uh, so um, a quick primer on 5G or any, or really 4G, this works for 4G as well. So you look up and you're outside and you see a cell, you see a, a cell tower. Um, there's an antenna and then on either on the pole or near the pole, there's a little box or maybe it's a, maybe it's a big box, you know, um, uh, we're, we're talking to Americans, now Americans. So maybe it's a few feet by a few feet. And inside of there is a, is a piece of hardware that runs software called a radio unit. And in the radio unit, we're basically converting that signal coming off of an antenna to uh, bits. So it's basically a DAC. And then what we do is there's a, uh, there is a distribution unit and a control unit, which basically proliferates that traffic up the stack, up the OSI stack. So from, let's say, data link and to IP and to TCP, and then ultimately whatever application we're running, and that goes off to some user plane functions where you do voice and data and analytics and all sorts of other things. And that all, for the most part, runs in, runs in software. And it's, it's a neat problem too, because uh, Bill, you'll, you'll, you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, years ago, you know, whether we were doing Java or we were doing, let's say we were doing Rails. So let's go back 15 years and let's say we were doing Rails and we had a, we had a web, we made up a website and we would hit it with like an HTTP get and it would come back in like um, uh, 500 milliseconds or 250 milliseconds. That was fast, 250 milliseconds. And then we were like, oh, let's get down to 100 milliseconds. And then years ago, um, we realized we could do better and it was easy and, and Go actually made it easier to write these types of sites. And we were getting into places where you would see like, oh, well, um, now we're down into a millisecond or let's say we're at like 900 um, microseconds. That's still too slow for telco. Um, the latencies that we're running in um, for to making sure that we don't have retransmits, let's say for the first hop, so from the, the tower to the first piece of software and back, let's say 20 microseconds. And that's that's the level that we're running in. It's, it's actually, it's, it's crazy. It boggles the mind of the things that we can do with software these days. And that software is being written in Go, running Kubernetes, and you're seeing that type of. Um, so uh, I will I will be the first person to say that you know Go is great. Go does 
Go does not run. Um, I would not run Go in a latency sen- in like a latency sensitive environment. Um, when it gets down to that level, whenever we need to guarantee things that are at 50 microseconds or you know 10 microseconds, then we go to C and C and Rust. And the reason why is Go is great, but you have basically a virtual machine and a garbage collector, and you don't know when it's going to run, so you can't actually say when you can clean up memory. But for a lot of the problems that we're solving, Go is actually great. But other um, languages are great as well. Yeah, I, I would. I was hoping to hear the word Rust when you were when you were talking about that. I'm working on. Um, so it's interesting. Telephone companies are trailblazers, but not because of the scopes. So imagine you're a cell phone provider in the United States. You might have um, 100,000 poles, 100,000 poles, 100,000 computers running 100,000 applications in coordination. And because of that, they are very conservative. And so C and C++ are out there, but um, we're seeing experiments with people doing things with Rust because Rust actually is a modern expressive language that still allows you to get the performance capabilities you like. Right, without the added latencies we're gonna experience with that runtime. So yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, when I'm teaching, performance and go, I'm always teaching, you have to have latency working for you. I never say you got to get rid of latency. No, you got to get the latency working for you. Yes. That's the idea that, that there's going to be latency there. So how do we mask it or hide it or or make sure that it's not in our way, right? But you, you don't have that kind of engineering choice right now where no, you're at. You no, have no to, we just can't have it. Can't have it at all, right? <laughs> yeah, we just can't have it. And because you That's don't right. want it, you want to dial a number on your phone and you want it, and you expect that call to go through every single time. And who how who knows how many people you're sharing that tower with? So it, it all so many things are going, and you get towers now. Like towers are up to like we're doing twenty five and forty um, gigabit off of towers now. Just imagine that has to happen in real time. That's amazing. So what's also amazing to me, and I got to get to your story, but this is amazing to me. So the telcos are. Would I say that they're outsourcing now all of this development to like companies like VMware? Oh uh, no, always they did? always they always did. Um, so get the so with telephone companies, they provide they are the they are the workers and they have all the infrastructure. They have all the fiber laid to where it needs to be. They own all the they own all the land or they own space on a pole. Now, when it comes to doing things inside of the telephone network, I mean, you have vendors, they're, they're called NEPs, they're network equipment providers. So people have heard of Nokia and, and Ericsson, and they write this software that does one thing. So, and let's say in 4G and 5G you have this, this concept called IMS, and that's what makes a voice call. So every time, it's like, whenever you make a phone call, it, it, your, your phone digitizes it, and then it goes to the network and the IMS decides if it's in network or out of network and it does all the right things. Uh, that software is not written by Verizon or AT&T or T-Mobile. That software is written by somebody else. And so basically a whole bunch of vendors come together and play. And that's actually what we're doing is, is making sure those vendors play together well and that we can actually build this infrastructure at scale. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, we could talk about that. But that's not what this podcast is about, right? That's fine. <laughs> This podcast is about you and telling your story. And I want people to hear how you got to where you are, because I think there's always these small pivotal moments or choices and decisions you made. And there's always somebody on that spectrum. And maybe hearing your story will give somebody just enough information to make a different choice or better choice for them, because you need this information. So my first question is, Think back and what is the very first memory you have on working on a computer? What's that first memory you have? And try to give me some timelines or dates so we can kind of also kind of play within the timeline. Okay, so I can think back 11 or 12. So that would have been 32 years ago because I'm getting old. So, you know, this is, um, well, 32 years ago. That's in the late 80s. Wow, we are old. <laughs> in the in the late eighties, my dad, who is who was in the military, and I'm not quite sure what he did, um, but he worked at a he worked at a base north of Baltimore in Maryland, and for some reason, they always came up with 
with a lot of decommissioned hardware and software and decommissioned computers. And he actually, one was decommissioned, he was able to bring it home and he brought it home for me. But he said, you can't use the computer because until you learn how to do things on the computer, it's not a toy, it's, it's for work. So he gave me a book that they actually, actually came up with on C++ and C. So I just learned C because I thought that that's how you did computers. I thought this is how we do computers. And so in the late 80s, I'm writing C because that's what I thought it was. And then I realized that I wanted to do graphical things. And at that time, C wasn't where it was. It was you write assembler. So I actually went and had my pirated copy of TASM and NASM, and I wrote um, Assembler. And I just thought that's how it was. And then I learned, oh, wow, there's much higher level languages. So then I went the other way. But I can think back from the late 80s, early 90s, um, that's how I computed. And and just to even continue this story along, uh, father was in the military, but he wasn't an officer. And we had, you know, we, we were comfortable. We weren't poor but we weren't wealthy and my father was an engineer. So buying things like Windows computers, like I can get a computer, but Windows was expensive. So that's actually how I found out about Linux, even when I was in high school. And I ran it because it was free and free for me. And the only effort was downloading it on the 30 floppy disk. So this was in the days of early Red Hat, early Slackware, early, the one that starts with the Y, but I can't say YGG, Yagazaril. And I just thought that's how you computed. And getting on the internet, um, I didn't have a computer that would actually run a browser because you had NCSA Mosaic and I had nothing powerful enough to run Mosaic. So what I would run is um, I would do Gopher and I would use links and I would dial up with, first I was using Slip and then I would use a PPP connection. So I was actually going to a command line on in a, in a, in a shell and Bash was not prevalent actually. Bash was not prevalent at that time. So it would have been like, um, for me, it had been like TC shell. And you would actually type the commands to log in, to dial in. And I would just use IRC and news groups and Gopher. And that's how I, that's how I started. That's what the internet felt like to me at the beginning. And I learned a lot from doing it that way. When I was able to click the first time, I'm like, this is crazy. So this is proprietary hardware that got decommissioned. Right. I mean, it was desktops. It, it was desktops. It was x86 hardware. Okay, it was x86 hardware. But it was like a. Um, so I mean, this is like running like. Um, uh, let me see. We had an we had an eighty. Eighty six or eighty eight, and we had that, and then we had a two eighty six, and it just um, X was not really like I could run X X on it, but it was not powerful enough to run anything. I had enough memory. I mean, this is the days whenever you had like a 16 megabyte hard drive, like 16 megabytes hard drive. What? <laughs> but at that, you said you were 11, 12. So you're still talking junior high school when yeah. you're starting some of this stuff. And this isn't, this is highly technical stuff that doesn't have the internet to guide you. Like if you didn't have the documentation and you couldn't fight through it, you were basically, I mean, I remember those days a little bit. Right. So you did things in a different way. So now, you know, in 2021, everyone wants things handed to them. I do too. I go to Stack Overflow. I search for things. I find answers in Reddit. I find answers all over the internet. That didn't exist. Where you found answers before were in news groups, or you read something like Byte Magazine and it was in there. And what I learned from doing that is that because you didn't have this instant, you hadn't learned principles. So you had to know how something worked. How do interrupts work? How do we actually call an interrupt so I can make a CPU do something? How do I uh, put uh, something on the screen whenever I learned how to do XLIP? How does, how does HTTP work? And the reason you knew that is because you didn't want to, you couldn't rely on anything. You had to, you had to make huge leaps from something you knew to something you don't know. Now you don't. Someone will, someone has a project or someone has figured it out. Or someone will just tell you, or you have a language like JavaScript where you could literally do anything. Um, and I think that maybe I was a little better off because I learned in, a, in an environment where you had no failsafe. There was no nothing to catch you. So you had to know what was going on. And I think that's ha- actually helped me become an engineer that can do everything because I understand principles. Did you ever find yourself in a situation where you broke the machine and it didn't reboot? Because you're playing yeah, some pretty low yeah, level oh stuff, my gosh. right? 
I have definitely, um, I have definitely smoked the CPU before. Um, I've broken hard drives. Um, I know when a monitor smells like when it doesn't work anymore, like a CRT. Um, I know what those you, things did are. Did you do that and have to tell your dad? Um, dad, uh, uh, I was a little bit older. Um, <laughs> when I was younger, I never really broke anything to the point where I couldn't fix it. But you must have been like afraid. Your dad already set a set a, a line like this is not a toy because I broke my first computer and I was so afraid to tell my mom that I spent two days without her knowing, and I got it back up and working. You know. Well, I don't actually. So here's a crazy thing. Um, one thing he, he taught, he taught me a few things, but one was no fear. Like you just move ahead. And if you're doing, you know, you move ahead and you're, and you're careful, don't worry about things breaking. And then another thing is that uh, I remember this, I was younger, I was probably like seven or eight and we lived in Germany and the power was out. And back then, if you're seven and eight in Germany and the power is out, there's literally nothing to do. So we were sitting in a room talking and he taught me how to spell impossible. And then once I learned how to spell impossible, he said, well, here's a lesson. Now that you, there's nothing impossible. You learned how to do the impossible. You learned how to spell impossible. So oh. nothing is impossible. So that's actually how I live. I still live with that, you know, as a, as a middle-aged man now. I, I still think the same thing. Nothing's impossible. That's amazing. That's a, you, and if you kind of, you have kids? I don't know if you have oh, kids. Yeah, yeah. You're teaching these same lessons to your kids, I imagine. You know, I'm trying. And so you have kids, so you'll you'll laugh about this. So my oldest one, she's an adult. And and I will say that she is a great individual. But what I'm realizing, it's not just what the parent does. The, the child has to really be engaged and want to do the same things, do these things and, and actually have that level of um, inquisitiveness to, to go out and find out what the world is. Not everybody has it. We can look up. We know this. Um, so my first one, you know, she does what she does. She's in college right now and she's doing okay. But she doesn't like look at computers the way that I do. I looked at them as the basically the any, anything machine. Anything is possible with this. Now, my youngest daughter, she just turned 13. So, you know, she's a teenager now. And she has never known a time where there's not been an iPhone. Like she's, the iPhone is older than her. And everything is always there. Like she doesn't even watch TV. She doesn't have one in her room. She watches YouTube on her tablet. And I think that she might, um, she has the, the wanting to know, but it's a different world now because so much more information is out there and they don't, they're not forced to learn the basics. So, so I try to um, explain it to her about this is why. That's actually the most important thing, knowing why something is, and then you can figure everything else out. So let's get, back to you. And I, I, I want to talk to you about your high school experience. Did you, so you, you're working with computers at home, thanks to your dad being able to bring home equipment and you're learning all that. Um, were you able to extend any learning in high school? Did they have programs for you with their computers? What year are we talking about when you were in high school? I got in high school in 1990. Fall of 1990 was my first year of high school. I graduated in 94. So in my, I know in my junior and senior years, we had a we, we had a computer lab the whole entire time, and it's where you went to go type on WordPerfect. And um, we had programming classes, and in the programming classes, they taught COBOL and Python. Um, I did not code. I mean, I knew I, I'm not Python Pascal, not Python at that time. So I, I um. I learned Pascal way past what um, we were teaching in a school, and I learned Copal enough to pass the class. But at that point, I actually knew how to program. I actually knew C++ at a time, so I spent my time writing things in C++. Um, but we had the lab, but I wasn't, funny thing, I wasn't, um, I enjoyed that stuff, but I didn't enjoy the the people who enjoyed it. <laughs> if, I, if I can, I, it wasn't me, it wasn't that person. But I will say that my senior year in high school, um, we had a, you know, there's a group and it's still around where it's the future business, business leaders of America. I won the Maryland state competition in 1994 and I went to the nationals, but I was, so I won it on a, just by going and I was not prepared for what was going to be in the nationals. So I didn't even rank in the nationals, but you know, um, we'll take wins as they come. 
Um, but so we did have it. It just wasn't like it is today. I mean, this is in the 90s. Internet was still dial up at that point in time for almost everybody. So I, I learned what I learned, but it wasn't a great um, education. Not I, I'm sure you can get something way better now. But you were actually, I mean, you were more advanced than pretty much everybody, maybe even the teacher at some point. Oh, definitely. than so a teacher, teacher no, it was a business teacher and she just taught, she taught the material. So she didn't even know. Um, I remember her. She didn't even remember or even know um, what was going on. They were just teaching it because they were teachers. So uh, I, because of how advanced you were, I was probably one of the more advanced kids in my high school at the time. We're talking, I graduated in 87, 87, 86, So 80, from 84 to 87, that's my high school, right? And I remember walking into the guidance department one day and I saw a computer and I pulled out the draw for the keyboard and I found the password. And next thing I know, I had access to all of the grades that they were recording for every student. And my stomach dropped like I wasn't going to go any farther. But I was so advanced that, right, they never at the time expected anybody there to be able to do even half the things that I did. Did you ever find yourself in a situation where you were able to actually like, or got bored and just said, let me play around here and access things that? No, no I was never that person. Um, but I can tell you what, in high school, I knew what a blue box, a brown box, beige box, um, a red box. I knew about all that. And like um, getting a brown box and taking over a PBX and having like a, a meet me call on the weekend with a whole bunch of weird randos. Yeah, I knew about that. But the whole grade thing never really stood out to me because I'm actually, I was anti-grade then, I'm anti-grade now. Um, just to let everyone know, in the United States and most places, you're on a 4.0 scale. I graduated from high school with a 1.7, which is the lowest you can graduate with, only because I said, well, I'm going to pass the test and I'm going to do well on the standardized test, but screw any of the other work because that's just busy work and I don't believe in busy work. Wow, that's interesting. When it came to um, like the, the things that you shouldn't do, oh, yes, actually, I did do one. So... Um, this is back to the, I don't have a lot of money um, type thing. So having dial up, so you, you could actually have dial up ISPs at that time. And we're way out of the statute of limitations for this. So I can actually say the name of the ISP. <laughs> um, so there was one called ClarkNet. Um, I figured out how their, um, how to create accounts and, and how to um, um, give myself a free account. So I gave myself a free account at ClarkNet. I never paid for any of my ISP stuff in high school, but it was, it was not, I mean, it, it was stealing. So um, I know that, but I didn't do anything bad with it. I just use it to learn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's all good. Like we, I, I meet a lot of people like yourself and me who, who had access to systems we shouldn't have because nobody knew better. And you tend to be in this kind of moment sometimes, right? Yeah. Um, but I wasn't pure either, Brian. I found a box of empty report cards and I had a dot matrix printer at home. So I started a quick business for about four weeks until I had rando people calling me for report cards and I got scared. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like I said, with the grades, my, my parents realized if, when I was in the beginning of high school, they're like, you got to pass these things. And then I failed English. And then I gave them a good reason of why English is not important to what I want to do in life. And, and, you know, after that, they just kind of let me go on my own. But I'll tell you what, I scored a perfect on the ACT, almost perfect on the SAT. And then all of the standardized tests, I always did really well on those. I said, I pay attention to what's important. And they're like, well, you'll never get in college. I did. So that's, that's the interesting thing now, right? Because you're, so one other question about high school was in your senior year and you're about to graduate, what was going on in your head in terms of next steps? Did you kind of know you wanted, what you wanted to do? Well, you I knew wanted I wanted to, to do something with computers, but I didn't want to go to college because, so this is a different time, different place. So I grew up right outside of Baltimore City and looking like me, you know, you have guidance counselors who will say, you know, they look at my grades, but didn't know what my test scores were and say, you'll never amount to anything. My dad will still bring this up. This guidance counselor told my dad I would never amount to anything. And, um, and 
That's not true. And so going to college, you know, um, um, deeply segregated areas too. Like, I mean, real talk, I didn't want to go anywhere around where there were no black people because it was not safe. And, and, and I didn't want to be judged that way, but my parents encouraged me to. So I went to the library and kids, this is what you had to do back in the day. Can't just go <laughs> online. They had all the colleges in the book. I opened up the book to one school. I applied to one school. I was accepted to one school. I went there for two years and then got a job. So you got a, did you get an associate's degree there or you just did oh, your no, two years no, no, and no, you said I'm no. done? I, I started on computer science stuff and realized that, you know, the first year stuff was, was easy. I was doing other people's homework assignments along with mine. But what happened is I got a job at an ISP and I was making no money. I was making 425 or 475 and then the minimum wage went up to five and a quarter. So You're I talking like 96, 95, 96. Actually, this had been in the summer of 95. Okay. And right. and then I got a raise to $8 an hour. And I'm like, oh, my God, I am making so much money. <laughs> um, but you're still living at home. You have no expenses. No, I have not so, lived at home except for when mom got sick for a few months. I know I lived on my own. But even still, I lived in, I was in Indiana at the time. And you can, you could live on $8 an hour. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like you were living in luxury, but you you could live on it, have a roommate. And at a while, after a while, it's like, you know what? I'm going to school to get this job. I already got this job. I don't need school anymore. And then I remember I, I, I moved back to Maryland from Indiana and I got a job and I was making $35,000 a year. And I'm like, holy moly. <laughs> and, and you know what? And, and and just and just like real talk, I don't have any like the salary weird things. Um, I made over seven digits last year. So going from there to here, <laughs> crazy. But I remember thirty five thousand dollars. I went and bought me a car. I was like, this is amazing. But let me let me stop you for a second because did you when you applied for that job where you ended up getting that salary, did. I guess they didn't care about the education side because you were so technically competent and that's what they needed at the time. That was exactly right? it. I mean, I had to answer for it, but once I, once I went through the interview process and I was good enough to work on a team where we were, um, this was an early web hosting company. I was good enough to work on that team and, and I was good enough. It's like the, the, I'm bringing it back to that, the day your dad brought home the computer and, and those six years essentially from like junior high to high school was really your college education at the end of the day, wasn't it? I mean, that really prepared you for, for the next step. Yeah. But I'll say this though, there's things that, that I think that I could have learned in college that I had to learn on my own that might've been better in a, in a more um, regulated safe environment like, I will tell you this, it's only been like five years since I really had a big, good handle on big O notation. I mean, intuitively, uh, uh, you know, whenever you're thinking about log in and N squared one, you know, into the cubes, I could, I could visualize it, but I couldn't talk about it. It was one of those things that I had an innate sense for it. But now, you know, um, probably in like 2014, 2015 is when I really am like, oh, that's what that means. So I couldn't have passed the Google interview until then, but I knew what it meant and I, and I, and I knew the patterns in code and I wish, and if I was in school, I probably would have learned that earlier, but I also would have learned a lot of other things that may or may not have been um, important, like um, an operating systems class. Um, I've written Linux kernel drivers um, and that was before high school or right in the beginning of high school. Um, I understand how Linux works. Um, I think an operating system class would have been neat, but I think it had mostly been um, wasted time because it's not um, applicable to most developers, almost all developers. I don't think the big O notation, I didn't even think about big O until I started reading white papers starting in like 2013, 14, 15. That's where it came from. It was, it was, it was the, it was to read the research literature and understand that or, or when people are talking about their Google interviews and, and thinking like that, but you know, I, you know, I'm glad that I know it now and I can teach it to people in an intuitive way, but 
it didn't even it didn't even um, cross my boundaries. And at that time, I've been working since you know ninety five. So you know that's a good ten years. Well, it's more than that. It's almost you know it's it's more than ten years into my career when I needed that. Well, I I feel like there's two. I'm going to generalize here. Two kind of classes of engineers. There's those that are really industry oriented, and that's been me, solving the business problems and trying to get them to work in a reasonable way that's maintainable. And then I feel like there's a whole level of academic engineers, the ones that that big O matters, the ones that uh, a lot of what's happening with the stuff you're doing today requires a lot of kind of academic engineering. Uh, you know, you're you're right. Um, there's there's a whole class of, of software. So if you're thinking about writing performance software, not like a faster web server, but thinking about um, whenever you're passing bits, so over. Um, uh, network interface or in a file system. And then you have to actually think about some of that research thing, research level stuff. Like writing a file system is difficult and it's a very researchy topic. You probably want the person who's thinking about that. They need that formal education, but for what, well, you know, for business problems, you know, that's a, it's a, there's another whole conversation that can be had there that this is actually, yeah, they're both programming, um, driving a taxi cab and driving a, um, a tractor trailer are both driving, but they're different. Yeah. And, and it's, and you need different education and, and different goals for both. I agree. Uh, let's get back to the job. So it's 95, 96, you're in university. You got this job now with this really at the time, great salary. What, what were you doing in that job? Just. Okay. So at that time, um, we were building a web hosting company, and at the time, it was one of the largest web hosting companies in the United States. We had a we had a ring around the United States. It was a fiber ring. It was like 672 megabits per second, which is back in the mid 90s was crazy. I had um, frame relay to my house, so I had 384 kilobits per second to my house. That was amazing. Um, Everyone had sons, and and later on we had um, 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 SGI machines on our desktops. And what what we were building there was a web hosting company. So imagine if you're hosting web, all the things you would need to do. So provisioning machines, doing monitoring, and um, doing security of that. This is ninety five, ninety six. Yeah, I don't even. Everybody had their own data centers back then. Like no, this... it was all porn. Don't don't get me wrong. It was all porn. <laughs> it was all porn. Ah, but even the thought of that back then it didn't even hit my radar screen. It was, and it was there, and 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 we built all this neat stuff, and and um, that was the first time I ever got fired. Actually, this the first time I got fired from that company. Because so, how long were you there? Yeah, how long were you there before? About a year, but. Um, at that time, so I'm 20 years old now, and I'm like, you know what? This whole getting up and being at work at 9 a.m. is ridiculous. I think best in the afternoon. So why don't I just come in when I think best? And they had a problem with that. And after a while, they're like, you can't work here anymore. And I'm like, whatever. I'll get another job. And I did. And so it's... um. How long did it take you to get the next job? Oh, so... Um, I kind of regressed after that and I went and it wasn't, it wasn't very long. It only took me like a week or so. And I worked as an IT person at a, in a school district. And that was the worst job I've ever had. I got fired from that job too. But, um, that was the last time I was ever fired. (laughs) So you were there probably less than a year. Again, you had to wake up in the morning. I was there just a few months. Yeah, it was awful. You know, what's funny. I always told people that if I had a job that required me to be in the same place every day at the same time, I wouldn't make it. I would, I would get fired myself. I, I, I can't handle that either. I, I, I feel you. Yeah. I mean, I'm better now. Uh, and, and I actually, as I grown up, you know, have children and my life is different. I like to get up in the morning and work in the mornings, but it's, it was more of, I didn't control my outputs and even as like a junior developer, junior engineer, junior person, you, if you can't control your creative outputs, that was very stifling for me. And I think that was my problem. Doing IT for schools, you know, you just go install computers and then you fix something and then you go to another school. And I'm like, this, this sucks. 
So what's the job that you get after the school and what year? We, now we got to be close to 98, 99. 97. Oh, okay. I went and I, I got a job at a company called World Duty Free America and they're a duty free shop. And I was a Unix admin at um, World Duty Free and not your normal. So you think uh, I'm a Unix admin. So we had SCO. Actually, we had a lot of SCO and AIX. And so all over the world, um, behind the behind the registers in the back offices, we had SCO. And then for like bigger stores, for big, back in on bigger computers, we had AIX. So I would go to all those duty-free shops. And so I traveled literally everywhere in the world. And I maintained point of sales for those. And this was the same time, this is right before the SCO, um, the SCO law problems. But that, that was what I did. I did that for about a year. So two things there. T define SCO, because that's a new word for me. What do you mean? SCO Unix. So Oh, okay. I know AIX. I knew IAX. That was IBM. Yeah, that was IBM. So SCO was their own thing. And I don't remember exactly why they went out of business, but it was some kind of either copyright or trademark or patent infringement. And they basically just went out of business. So you're running these... I guess little mini frame, like these aren't microcomputers now. You're running IX, yeah, well, running some AIX large stuff that we are running. If you're running an, an IBM SP class, basically in the in the late '90s, that was a supercomputer. Those computers were so powerful, and the resin and the magnetic resonance between those. Um, first of all, they were about a million dollars a pop. They're probably like almost seven feet tall, and you couldn't put them close together because if you put them too close together, the magnetic resonance between the disk would actually affect one another because they were that densely packed. Um, those machines were amazing. I've never seen, uh, only in some Sun hardware, where you could actually pull a CPU out of that thing and replace it while it was running. You could reboot it without rebooting it. You could basically reboot the operating system and then swap it out. So the machines never went down. It's amazing. amazing. They, they ran corn shell, so they were horrible. They were horrible on the desktop. Oh, my gosh. Hey, you're running an entire POS with the back system on that machine for each store. And we had like, and we had crazy DR, like you know, even in the like late nineties, we had DR, we had, we had our machines in our office outside of Baltimore and then up in New Jersey, outside of New York, uh, up near Newark, we had a whole DR and we would actually do that. And we actually had a pretty cool system to, to do all this retail. So you imagine have a hundred stores point of sale across, you know, across the world. Um, so all these, all these airport shops and all these border stores and, and we kept it up. And we went through the Y2K and nothing went down. Were you moving data out of those PS POSs to a central database or everything was manual reports till back? Yeah. Um, so I wasn't. Um, so here's funny things. I knew how to write software, but I didn't have confidence to be a software developer at that time. Um, so um, I could write software and I would, I would actually approach my Unix administration as a software developer. But um, what they would do is there was it was a lot of batch actually most most of it is all batch so you just take daily sales and and inventory and you move them back and forth and it was a lot of times it was over dial up or it was a bigger store it was a lease line somewhere yeah it's a, it's an actually complicated problem i had a company approach me in 2008 to solve a similar problem with 30,000 stores over across the world and i said no I said, I don't want anything to do with this one. Because if things break, you got to go to the store. Mm -hmm. And the people there aren't technical enough. And I just said, things are going to break. I can do whatever I can, but this was going to keep me up at night. I, and I walked away from it. The times where um, it wasn't safe for Americans, like even places where it's safe for Americans, I would go. So one time I went to Columbia. Um, that's Columbia, the country. And we're down there and... And some place, one time I went there, I couldn't leave the airport. And while I was there, I had a guy with a gun who followed me around wow. to make sure I didn't get kidnapped. Oh, but yeah, then I was thinking, I don't, they don't want me. I just go, I, I, they wouldn't want me. Nobody's paying any money for me. So, but still, that was the, the amount of danger that was involved in that job. People do get kidnapped. So you, how long were you with that company maintaining and installing the systems? It was not much past... It, let me see. Wow, I'm I'm, I'm Y2K. To, yeah, so. no. So it was around there. It was around the whole Y2K time. 
And then I went to work at another porn company because that's what I guess my thing was. And that porn company became advertising.com. Interesting. So they ended up building tech that ended up being able to drop advertisements. Yeah, talk about that. Yeah, so so this so the company um, was called Technosurf with a K, and started by these two brothers, John and Scott Ferber in Baltimore, and we were doing porn ads because you know porn actually. Um, this sidebar here. Um, I don't care how you feel about pornographic materials, and I'm not telling anyone to watch or not watch it. But what I'm saying is that the technology that is developed to give a good experience to people who want to preview that type of content definitely pushed to get, pushed forward the state of the art for the internet for a long time because of bandwidth, latency, um, just the amount of video. And so we did that. And advertising.com, um, I worked on um, a couple of their weirder, more advanced projects and building out data centers for them. So I was the person, you know, we'd go down to Equinix or wherever else we had a data center and we would fill it up and, uh, and, and I would do the Unix work there. And then I would also do the networking work as well. So I remember the first time, and this is, this is crazy, um, in 2000 and around 2000, where we had this huge core switch or core router and we plugged in dual gigabit cables. And that was a big deal. And then the network tech from Equinix came and tripped over it and pulled it out. And I remember my <laughs> boss yelling, you know how much that cost us? <laughs> so that was um, uh, that was actually the point where I was realizing, well, maybe I can write software. And I knew I could. Um, and, I, and I was. I've always write, written software, but not as a title. So um, from there, I went to a, um, a company that was, I'm not going to mention her name. Um, they're a little bit on the fringe where they were a protection company. So you've heard of Pinkerton. We work with companies like Pinkerton to do physical protection, to do executive protection. And we go to like their um, their training centers where, you know, you think in your mind that, you know, you're protecting someone. No, they are taught to kill. And I've seen some of these things and I'm like, wow, I'm glad those people are doing these things. Um, so there um, we built a system to um, basically uh, track execs flying all over the world, and we would off we would basically work with uh, with the United States and other governments to provide travel advisories. While I was there, um, this was an a- AWS was just offered started offering their um, you could create your own book. So actually, I've written. Um, well, I've generated lots of books, hundreds and hundreds of books on AWS that probably don't exist anymore. Um, and, that's, and that was where I did programming or matching up um, from, let's say, from Saber, the, the, travel, um, the travel software company, um, pulling PNRs from there, which are basically the records of trips and matching those up and actually figuring out where our people are in the world at any given time. So that's what I wanted to ask you, because you're talking about maybe 2004 now, mobile phones. So I was there in 2001. Actually, I was there from 2001 till 2004. All right. So like mobile phones are not yet. I think iPhones are just maybe no, coming out. There. Actually, while I was there. there, we went from 1G to 2G. Um, so we went from analog phones to digital phones, like digital voice while I was there. So that was around you know 2003, early 2004. So you're not building mobile apps yet to track all these people. So I was going to ask you, how are you tracking all these people? So you're... You had to, it wasn't like an automated way. People had to register where they were. And then we can register where their security was. And, and, and then actually in a lot of big companies, um, when you leave the country, this is why, hey, if you work at a big company, it's why they, uh, why they track you. It's not because they care where you are. They need to know where you are if something bad happens. And that's, what this, that's where we got a lot of our information from. So you're at this company for three. So what I'm seeing from you so far from, let's say, high school to 2004 is if I were to look at your resume, it would have been flashing warning signs all over the place because you're bouncing almost every two years for one reason or another. I will tell you why. And I didn't realize this until, you know, a few years back. Um, I've never left a job because of lack of um, engagement. I've left a job because of bad managers. And, and, and this is actually like an interesting time to even say this. I've had a lot of racist managers. 
just just straight up treat me like dirt and and you know have peers where they will they would bring their peers in a certain conversation, but not bring me, but I was a senior person in the room. And I left a whole bunch of bad jobs. Matter of fact, one day, one time, the job after this one, I convinced a friend of mine, we're going to quit that. We went up and told the boss, we're going to quit at the same time. So you're not going to treat me like, you're not going to treat us this way. We're employable. And we were, we left that job. And I had a job by the time I got home that afternoon. And it's not because of, um, it's not because I left because I was doing poorly. No, I'm a high performer. Well, I was left because it was a bad environment for me. And you never had one interview question this or no, did they it come do, up and you know, had answers? If, if that's what they're looking for, if that's what they're looking for, you know, then I don't want to work there. You know, I don't, um, there's usually a reason whenever we see a lot of short tenures and you find out the person is competent of why they left. So if you can, if you see short, if you see short tenures and then you see that I'm an idiot, well, you know, you can make your decision. But if you see short tenures and, and I'm not an idiot, hey, there's something else going on there. I might not have even brought you in for an interview looking at a resume like that. Like I find it super interesting. Your loss. Uh, well, it would have been my loss, right? It's making me rethink a little bit now uh, s- some of that, the criteria I have. But all right, we got basically about 15 minutes left and 16 years to go. So you're like now in 2004, let's see if we can jumpstart a little bit. Yeah, so we're 2004. So that would have been leaving iJet, going to work um, for the government. And that's where I quit. I worked in a sub-basement, a basement of a basement in DC doing things I can't really tell you about. But I can say that they were something with... um, something with FBI data and something with um, um, some other data. And this database did get hacked in the last few years by the Chinese or the Russians or whoever. I don't know who did it. Um, But I told them that was going to happen back then. So whatever. Um, Then we quit that job. Poor, awful boss. Then I went to a job, um, worked this company called USI in Annapolis, Maryland. And USI at the time, there was no clouds. Um, USI did a few things that are still notable to this day. Um, USI actually um, had a data center where they were plugging hardware and could boot up hardware. Like they could boot it up and install software on it and install like Oracle software, Siebel PeopleSoft, or other types of software like that. Um, USI invented the concept of SaaS. What year is this now? Well, USI was, a, it was in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, they were purchased by AT&T, so they don't exist anymore. I actually think that building is finally empty and they might be getting ready to knock it down. But yeah, USI, I think, officially invented the term SaaS. And we had a monster Perl code base there, million, couple million lines, I think. Perl, okay. And some other things came out of there. Um, there's a, a monitoring package came out of there. The things that we were doing at USI were so novel at the time. And this, and, and they were a little bit early, but they were, they were crazy. No one in the industry was doing this. Had we thought been a little bit more proactive, you know, we could have, we could have had um, some more of the ideas around the beginnings of what cloud was before it was cloud. I left there, um, just once again, bad interactions with managers. Um, where did we go after that? But you were developing there? You were... Yeah, so that, at this point, I'm now confident enough to be a developer. Okay. Um, so I went, I was at, um, now this is where it gets weird. I don't, I've had so many jobs, I don't even remember all of them. Um, actually, here's another reason I would move because no one would give you a raise or, or you would get, or I would find, I would be brought in and find out that I made way less than everybody else. So I'm leaving. I'm just going to leave. And, oh, I know where it was revolution health down in DC. And that was interesting. Um, revolution health. Um, a lot of the engineers that created living social came from there. So that whole world came from revolution health, um, founded by Steve case, billionaire, um, AOL guy. Um, that was just rails job. Um, cool thing coming from um, revolution health. So the idea of doing migrations and numbering them that actually is in like, um, Ruby on rails and then like goose and and Goland that came from, um, revolution health. Uh, they invented that there. What year are we talking about now? Oh, we are in 90, uh, no, we're in 2000, let's say five, six and seven, somewhere around there. 
So I want to I want to know how you get to Heptio because because I have some questions about that. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that pretty quick. So from Revolution Health, I went to this um, medical research company that was doing clinical medical research company in Baltimore. Um, and and I have um, one thing to say, you miss a paycheck for me, you'll miss me forever. They miss the paycheck. They miss me forever. I went to another company. Um, they did the same thing. Miss the paycheck. Miss me forever. I went to another company with a friend of mine who is one, was a CTO at AOL and nicest guy in the world, Marty Fisher. And it was a small company and I outgrew them. So then I went to work at a company. Um, so it was like Gold Star where I was contracting out on the West Coast selling tickets. And then it was um, ideally where we were doing um, some kind of sales. And then I got into Thunderbolt Labs and at Thunderbolt Labs, you know, we were developing and um, I built software that um, does medical um, disease research. Notice my, my, my work is all over the place because if you have principles, you can solve any problem. But uh, I want to interrupt you for one second. When did you get married? Are you oh, doing this married while married? So as part of you quitting jobs for legitimate reasons, but you're quitting jobs, you're married, is your like what's always held me to jobs, even when I was like, uh, was the idea that I can't come home without a paycheck because I got a wife and kids to support. Oh, I didn't say I never come home with a paycheck. I would never quit a job without having a new one. I've never had a staycation. Uh, no way. Y y y okay. You always lined up the next job right yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never quit gotcha, in, gotcha, in, gotcha, in gotcha. anger. I quit because there was something better. So Thunderbolt Labs, and then from Thunderbolt Labs, that got me into... Um, um, we made we made really good money there at Thunderbolt Labs, um, but there was some disagreements, and I was like, I want to get a job again. So I worked at. Um, now we're getting close to Heptio, so I worked at DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is actually where a lot of you all know what I've I've done. So at DigitalOcean, I was one of the big movers to moving DigitalOcean to Go. Um, so DigitalOcean's mono repo idea, DigitalOcean's um, API client, so Godo, um, the command line client, um, Do Cuddle. I wrote those. And then once again, um, I get treated weird and, and I was writing more code. I actually wrote those things, not even in the engineering group. I was a developer advocate at the time. And I was like, this is weird. So let me go work for a big company. So I went to work at Capital One, director of engineering Capital One and learned a lot there in a year, but realized that there was no real growth for me. If the more technical, if I wanted to rise to the ranks at a director of a I was an IC director and then I became a people director and I was had to lose my tech by state of capital one. So I didn't want to do that. So there it gets me to a company called Heptio. And the way I got to Heptio is um, Joe Vita asked me multiple times to come work there. And I'm like, no, dude, you work for a startup. I work for a big company and I got a big paycheck. And he's like, no, I think we have some good things. But it, it basically came up, I interviewed at Microsoft and was done very dirty there. And just in that, that moment of weakness, I said, all right, I will interview with you all. And they stuck J Dave Cheney on me for an interview. And Dave Cheney gave me a hard interview, but he's like, well, dude can code. So that's how I got the FDO. So let me, let me stop you there for a second. I, I do remember the first time I got to know you was through DigitalOcean. And you were doing, so my question then is, is the time you spent being a DevRel and being more out in the open and people getting to know you and people, a larger audience really getting to see how technical and smart you were, is that, I, I, I think that there's value in that, right? You think that played any role in know, getting to know Joe or Joe recognizing no, you? Or? Actually, I think I've always been the same person and still operating the same way, whether I was a DevRel or, or I was uh, doing um, engineering. Um, but the problem is, is that people couldn't reconcile that, at least at DigitalOcean, they couldn't reconcile it at the time. Like, how are you going to write all this code and still be doing community stuff? I'm like, well, it's pretty easy. I do one at a time. And I will still be as productive as any other engineer on this team that you can find. And I was. But when you were, we didn't really get to explore any sort of network that maybe you've, you developed as you were moving through companies. Was there... Was there any sort of networking that you were doing? Was there meetups? No, was there no? Actually, no. I don't. I don't actually believe in that. I don't. Um, I've had so funny things. So all the way back at the beginning of two thousand two thousand one, um, I had a friend, 
and he is the only person that I talk that I talk to ever since that I talk to consistently. I'm not a networker. Um, I I am just wanting to make sure that um, people know who I am, but I don't like the whole networking aspect. I'm like that introverted extrovert or the the opposite. I don't like the whole networking thing. It's never been. I didn't get any of these jobs on um, referrals or anything like that. These are you know people came and looked for me, and I just wanted. And the reason that it is is because I was always out in the open asking good questions or trying to help somebody do good things. But I never look at it as like a networking type of activity. Because you're from from all the stories and, the, and and I talk, you know, talking to people, you're kind of breaking the mold here. You're finding success by jumping when things are not right or the next opportunity comes along, regardless of how long you've been somewhere. You're experimenting with lots of different jobs and lots of different companies. Uh, I mean, talk a little bit about that. Um, so recently, I've been reading The Seven ha- Habits of the Effective Person um, by Covey. It's a popular book, came out in 89, The Seven Habits of Effective People. And I'm only to like the third habit right now, but I'm realizing that a lot of the habits that he's talking about are things that I just did inherently. Maybe that's part of my success. I stumbled on these early. One of the most important things, and I'll tell us to any engineer, any person, you never go into something without having a goal. So no matter what's happening, I always have a goal. I'm always working in a direction. Even if I get there in a non-traditional means, I still get there. And the problem is, is now people are just, they don't have any goals. Their goals are to make money or their goals are to be the boss. Like, no, mine are to have the freedom to do whatever I want, whenever I want. And what does that mean? Well, it changes over time, but that's still my goal. And even when I'm writing software, my goal is to do this. When I'm solving product problems, my, our goal is to do this. Now, now let's start at the beginning. What are the inputs? And then working my way. And I've always been able to do that. So it seems like I'm moving around in, in crazy directions. But the thing is, I'm so focused on where I want it to be, which was independent enough to do whatever I wanted. I would always find myself in that right spot. Wow. Okay. So I uh, could take five more minutes here. You had a great experience at Heptio, right? Like yeah. VMware ends up buying Heptio. So I imagine this would have been one of the first jobs where you stayed for more than three years. <laughs> yeah, actually. So um, starting from my Heptio first date to now, I am over three years. Okay. And and you're, how are you liking VMware in terms of, because now you're back in a very large enterprise, right? You're back in that, with their security there, but, and it looks like you're solving some interesting big problems. Yeah, well, the, the organization has supported me as a contributor and has recognized my efforts as a contributor and has promoted me because of those efforts. Um, overall, my experience at VMware is very good. But I will say this, um, when you're working at a large company, um, between uh, there, there's, a, there's a, a large span between sometimes the doers and the idea people or the doers and the people who can make all the decisions. And that sometimes is a problem. Um, well, not for me personally, because I'm going to find out, but it's a problem for a lot of people who get, who get sucked into it. And I tell you what, big companies will make you lazy because there's always someone else that can do whatever you're going to do. Like when you're in a startup, you got to do everything. I got to go be a product person and I have to go solve this problem and I got to go push it to production. And sometimes in these big companies where those are all three separate roles with three separate executives who run that. And sometimes things are challenging. But I think if we can change how, change what we're actually working towards, we can actually make that better. And that's the hard piece. That's the hardest part of my job right now. Wow. Okay. We are pretty much to the end of our hour. We got to where I wanted to. And I, I don't know. I feel like for those of you listening to this who have very much been like Brian, where you're just you're going to set that goal and you're going to move towards that goal and you're not going to let anything like I have to show a good resume stop you. I mean, Brian, you are really the person that shows that you can be very, very successful being goal-oriented and not worrying about what your resume looks like and not worrying about staying somewhere that isn't healthy. Just make that jump, make that move. But can I safely say that 
pretty much every job that you jump to, there, there was an, an improvement. My uncle always said, change is good, but always make sure that you're improving with every change. Always been, it's always been for the better. And not even all these money. I think I've only moved once for less money, but it was because I liked my life better there. But that was, it was only one time. Actually, no. When I went to Capital One to FBO, I, I gave up a chunk of change, but I, I will make that back, you know, hand over fist over the next couple of years. Won't even, it'll be a blip. Um, but it, it can't just be money. It has to be, um, you're getting a you know, better experience, better working environment. You know, you're learning more. Um, and then also, you know, there's better money and, and you got to figure out what better is. And that's what a lot of people, I think, skip over. What is better for me? Not, you know, what is, what is best? Someone tell me, go figure it out. Yeah. What's, what don't, not what society is telling you is, should be important. What, what's best for you? But I do want to say, I just want to leave on these things, on these ideas though. Um, I didn't, my journey is not my journey alone. Um, people will see, you know, people have helped me and open doors. And then I've also, my goal is to make it better for me being there. And I think that's something that you got to focus on too. You can't just be the best in a room. That room needs to be better for you being there. That's where the, that's actually where the real win comes from. You know, you can be the smartest person in a room, but if you are, no one else is, who cares? If you're making everybody else in the room smarter, that's where the wins come from. And, and we need to focus on that more. You know, my dad always told me, leave a place better than when you got there. Yeah, yeah. I kind of like, um, think don't that's what I'm hearing. Think. Uh, that's all good. All right, Brian. Thank you for this hour. Thank you for telling your story. And I and I know it's going to help a lot of people who um, have been inundated with, with kind of other ideas. I love this. I love this. And it's really going to be exciting to see uh, where you end up in the future as well. But that project you're working on right now sounds sounds important too. So It's important and challenging. So we shall see. And we shall see. All right. Well, this is Bill Kennedy with Brian Lyles. And thank you for sharing the last hour with us here at the Arden Labs podcast. Mm -hmm.